I was around five years old when I first claimed that I wanted to grow up to be a roller coaster designer. My projects and experiences over the past few years have reaffirmed to me a growing love and passion for the themed entertainment industry. While my specific end goals may have changed over the years, an underlying infatuation of roller coasters and theme park design have brought me to this point. Now, here we are 17 years later. My name is Joe Gerber, and welcome to my senior capstone project, the Magic School Bus Manic Field Trip. This project started as a joke in a conversation with a friend, and has since developed into the attraction I get to present to you today. In my presentation today, I will be expounding on why I chose this show as the theme of my ride, as well as where it could fit into the industry. I will then summarize my research for this project and will share with you the story of my specific ride by highlighting three main design elements. The space and ride building, the attraction mechanism, or how the ride works, including the vehicle, and finally, the story arc for my experience. So to begin, I'll expound on why I chose the Magic School Bus as my ride's theme. Within the theme park industry, there are many different rides and attractions themed to kids' television shows. From Sesame Street, to SpongeBob SquarePants, to older classics such as Tom and Jerry, Scooby-Doo, and even Popeye the Sailor Man. But there are none themed to a specific TV show, which in and of itself is already an immersive, entertaining, and engaging storyline, which would set a premise for a very interactive, unique adventure of a ride. So this is why I entertained the idea of the Magic School Bus being the basis on which to build the theme and story of my ride. It's convenient to note that the concept of the show itself naturally includes an experience that is educational as well. Acknowledging the technology which I'm going to propose, to the degree of immersion to which I'm going to apply, I saw the Magic School Bus as a theme that will deliver on both the educational and immersive end. People also love immersive storytelling through rides and attractions. Over spring break, I had an incredible opportunity to go to both Universal Studios and Disney World and experience some unbelievable examples of engaging attractions myself. Designers with these parks creative teams pull out all of the stops to tie together the story of an attraction, implementing thematic elements into everything from full-scale props to details in the light fixtures. Theme park storytelling has escalated to a degree known as full immersion, where parks design rides or entire worlds where guests are so immersed in the story of the attraction through stimulation of all of their senses that they genuinely feel they're active participants within the experience. Flawless examples of this include the Wizarding World of Harry Potter at Universal and Toy Story Land and Galaxy's Edge at Hollywood Studios. After getting an addicting dose of what these kinds of rides can offer, I gained a new level of understanding and inspiration for how to go about my own attraction. These insights have led me to my project's problem statement, which is to design an engaging theme park attraction that embodies the property and concepts of the Magic School Bus television show and allows guests to be immersed in the storyline in a complete sensory experience. I had a lot of help in developing this vision through conducting several interviews. These were with people who are professionals within the field, ride and attraction developers, and also just pure avid fans of themed entertainment. Through these interviews, I gleaned incredible pieces of information, inspiring directions for my project, and insight into my key deliverables. A major portion of my research was also dedicated to watching many episodes of the original Magic School Bus show. After watching the first two seasons, I could more fully live and breathe the intellectual property of the brand, as well as be inspired for what my adventure and story will look like. Along the way, I also took screenshots of interior and exterior spaces, as well as opportunities for vehicle alternatives so as to align the themes of the show with my deliverables. Also from these episodes, I was able to create user personas for some of the main characters. I observed some of their preferences and translated them into practical attributes for a ride. This includes the opportunity to learn through good storytelling and an experience that is engaging and interactive. Fortunately for Tim, Phoebe, and Ms. Frizzle, their tastes align with the vision of my project. I formulated several design guidelines that have helped me stay on track throughout my project. Key ones include that repetitive idea of immersive storytelling and full sensory experiences. But I also aspired to propose a system that would allow for greater rider capacity, so as to improve the overall ride experience. Combining these ideas, my overarching goals for this project were threefold. To design a theme park attraction that is believable, one that would accommodate nicely the trends and technologies of the current industry, while still being unique, providing a thrill that guests can't go anywhere else in the world to experience all while paying attention to details and elements that make this ride a pure example of entertainment. 
I am now going to shift to what I produced in order to accomplish these goals. It was vital to begin this project by grounding my work and design elements into the story of my attraction. I spent a day storyboarding my ride. This was the framework on which the rest of my deliverables would be built. An in-depth look into the story of my ride will be discussed in a little bit. The first key element to telling the story was designing the space in which to build my ride. Naturally, I honored the property of the show by basing my ride building completely on Walkerville Elementary School. Interior and exterior design elements were pulled directly from what I observed and estimated from the show. I sought to pay attention to everything from building proportions to signage and props within the show's main classroom, all of which are storytelling elements within many Disney rides and attractions. So, I saw it only appropriate to propose this ride being built in Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando. Here is a site master plan of what the ride building would look like in the context of Fantasyland, which is one of the magical sections of Disney World's original theme park. Before I even began exploring what the elements within my ride could look like, I wanted to perfect the look and proportions of the external facade of my building. I built a 1 to 120 scale model replica of Manic Field Trip's ride building. I introduced force perspective into its design, using an optical illusion to make certain features appear smaller than they actually are. For example, my exterior windows are actually around 35 feet tall, which gives the illusion of it only being a two-story school, as opposed to the actual 50-foot tall ride building. The attraction building, including the ride space, queue lines, pre-show room, and loading platform, boasts a total square footage of over 60,000 square feet, well over half of which belong to the ride space itself. The queue is broken down into two different lines. The standby queue line is for all general admission guests. This line will work its way through five different relevant spaces found within an elementary school, including classrooms, labs, and a cafeteria. For those guests who want a shorter wait, they can bypass all of these themed rooms with the purchase of Disney World's Lightning Lane, which will give them quick access to the front of the line. Members from these two lines will merge together to proceed into the pre-show classroom. A few dozen guests at a time will be guided by cast members into the space. They will watch about a two-minute video introducing them to the backstory of the ride before another cast member leads them into the loading area. And finally, after loading and experiencing their manic field trip, guests will exit out the ride building, back through the hallway of the school, and out into the plaza area outside of the attraction entrance. Let's put ourselves into the shoes of a guest with a lightning pass. Located at the back of the park, guests will work their way through Magic Kingdom before entering the plot of land designated and themed to the show. Lighted wayfinding and signage will help assist riders all the way along the queue. Upon entering the pre-show room, immediately take note of all the intentional design elements incorporated into the set. Decorated throughout the classroom are typical objects found within an elementary school classroom, including desks, lockers, school supplies, and playful signage but there are also props purposely modeled or placed to mimic as accurately as possible that which is observed in the show. The large window at the front of the room is the focal point of the space. The pre-show video is projection mapped onto the massive one-sided window and serves as a practical means of displaying the ride's backstory to all upcoming riders. There's a lot to take in, and the space takes a dip into the idea of full immersion, allowing the guests to feel like they are students truly walking the halls of Walkerville Elementary. Even though Manic Field Trip is an enclosed dark ride, the over 50 foot tall red brick school building is a spectacle for guests as they approach. Friendly faces from the show are often used throughout the queue as digital or static signage, allowing the waiting experience to resurrect some favorite memories from a few classic episodes. In addition to wayfinding, Disney cast members also help guests navigate their way to the entrance of the ride. Riders will file into the switchbacks between desks, admiring the personality of each student coming out through the content on them. Every corner and wall of the room is decorated, allowing the build-up to the pre-show to be as believable an experience as possible. Once the pre-show queue is filled, the lights dim, allowing the projection of the pre-show video to play on the window. From the guest perspective, the illusion allows them to see Miss Frizzle in the school parking lot outside, working under the hood of a malfunctioning magic school bus. After watching the remainder of the show, they are then prompted the rest of the way through the queue with the upcoming challenge of finding and saving their beloved lost teacher. 
The ride building in and of itself is a huge contributor to the story of Manic Field Trip, but technology and creativity combine to fill in several remaining gaps in the narrative. I want to now transition to explaining the ride mechanisms, or the unique technologies and innovations that help make this ride a unique and immersive experience. To begin to understand the intentions behind some of these mechanisms, it's important to first understand rider capacity. Good capacity is a ride developer's best friend. It's basically how many guests an attraction can take in, knock their socks off, and spit them out happier within a certain amount of time, usually an hour. You can figure out this number by considering a few main variables, primarily the length of the ride, how many riders the vehicle can hold, and how often the vehicle is dispatched. Without nerding you to sleep, I can breeze over these formulas to find my ride's theoretical hourly ride capacity, as well as how long the queue line needs to be in order to hold that many people. I found an online ride simulator that calculated the hourly capacity of a ride based on vehicle capacity and dispatch interval, scene length, and total ride duration. The variable W is what can fluctuate the most in these equations because it's merely an estimate of how long a guest will wait for my ride. For instance, if Manic Field Trip only takes on guests through a virtual queue, then riders will sign up for queuing during specific hourly time slots. So the longest the guest would wait for the ride is about 60 minutes. This would yield a THRC of over 1,600 riders per hour, which would demand a queue length of over 2,100 feet. Another crucial step in being able to propose a 20 second dispatch interval for Manic Field Trip was understanding my ride layout. There are a total of nine scenes in my ride, and to increase the believability of the attraction in relation to the show, there could be only one ride vehicle in a scene at once, which would make for a more personal ride experience with the other students in your bus. But if a scene is 40 seconds long, then how can I propose a shorter dispatch interval? There's an attraction at Universal Studios Islands of Adventure called Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey, and it absolutely blew my mind and served as a huge inspiration for my ride layout. My friend who works with Universal Creative explained the mechanism to me even further, and the concept which I'm about to show you is a brilliant rendition of that ride experience. The concept is a scene carousel. A vehicle will pull into the scene and they'll experience it from the beginning. As the carousel spins, so does the ride vehicle. Ride vehicles keep getting allowed into the carousel, beginning the scene at the same point. The scene ends for each vehicle when it dispatches from the carousel, so there will be four vehicles in the same scene at once, just at different points. And the carousel's rotation is synced to the system's dispatch interval, letting in and out a vehicle each time a domed screen aligns with the ride's course. There are a total of five scene carousels in the ride, along with other mechanisms that accommodate the recurring entrance of ride vehicles. The transition between scenes is also short and seamless, so that the story can be told without any intrusive gaps here and there. While Forbidden Journey served as a huge inspiration for my ride layout, my vehicle idea has been spawned from other attractions, including Disney Imagineering's Brain Children, Remy's Ratatouille Adventure, Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, and Rise of the Resistance. These are all trackless dark rides, which utilize automated guided vehicles. By not requiring guide rails of any sort, they're able to cross existing paths, reverse, and rotate. Many trackless dark rides, including Manic Field Trip, use Wi-Fi and radio frequency identification-based local positioning systems to navigate the vehicle. This technology, merged with creative theming, translated into this solution. Riders in groups of nine will be able to board a trackless variation of the Magic School Bus, but in its transformed state of a theme park ride vehicle. These vehicles will be about 16 feet long. Riders will sit in three rows of three, with each successive row being elevated an additional six inches in order to increase rider visibility for those in the rear. The loading station will have both a load and unload platform, separated into two different rooms. Each platform will accommodate two vehicles so that a total of 18 riders can board at once. The spectacular thing about this existing ride technology is the motion capabilities of these vehicles. The buses in Manic Field Trip have a total of six degrees of freedom mobility. These include surging, which is the vehicle's most basic forward and backwards motion. Swaying is the vehicle's side-to-side -side linear motion. In the vehicle themselves are capable of movement, including heaving up and down. But they're also capable of rotational motion about all three axes. This includes rolling, 
or forward and backwards tilting along an axis perpendicular to the vehicle's length. Rotation about the vertical axis, which is called a yaw. The real magic in these capabilities is when they're brilliantly working together in order to enhance the experience of each scene in the ride, creating a heightened sense of believability and immersion. An example of this is in the drop track scene. The vehicle will file into its own individual pod where it will be lifted up. While ascending, the riders will be experiencing a scene synced to the upwards climb of the entire floor. At about three stories, the vehicle will proceed forward into the drop capsule, where the climax of the attraction sinks a more intense scene with a sudden gut-wrenching plunge of the whole pod. It is moments like these, where the perceived projections in digital form are blended with what is actually happening physically, that make trackless dark rides, including Manic Field Trip, a breathtaking experience. Finally, let's get to that story. In a theme park ride story arc, much like a good novel, there are generally three phases to consider. The setup, the experience, and the payoff. I will highlight each scene in my ride and how they tie the entire story together from the first impression to the last. Here I wanted to capture the essence of this story, incorporating the feel or idea of various scenes while prompting moods that are playful and engaging, but also intense and suspenseful. So let's get to it. In the pre-show, guests will file into the classroom and watch the narrative of Miss Frizzle fixing her broken down bus. While hooking a hose up to the engine, the bus goes crazy and flings the beloved teacher against the classroom window. After giving a reaffirming word to her class, she is launched hopelessly into the distance before a parachute is released, allowing her to float off the screen in safety. The vehicle has now transformed into the ride mechanism that their riders will soon be boarding. After departing from the loading room, the vehicle will enter scene carousel 1. Students hear the reassuring voice of Miss Frizzle expressing that she is safe and still has control of the bus. A red flashing light on the front of the vehicle is an indicator that she is with them. But, she warns that if the receiver stops flashing, she will lose both control of the bus and all the riders. With the classic bus, do your stuff, the vehicle spins violently and begins its transformation. In a cloud of smoke and fog, the bus regains visibility in scene 2 to reveal that the bus has transformed into an airplane climbing high into the sky. Over the receiver, Miss Frizzle educates riders on how water vapor droplets are formed from clouds into raindrops. The bus is then caught in a violent rainstorm and gets trapped in a giant droplet itself. The rainstorm splashes the bus into a river far below. It is recklessly tossed about in the large rapids before hitting a rock and abruptly changing direction. As the vehicle enters scene 4, riders are met with the roar of an unforgiving waterfall looming up ahead. In a blur of consuming water, the bus flings backwards off the edge of the falls and begins plunging. In scene 5, the rapid descent of the bus is abruptly halted by a large tree branch extending out over the river. The bus drives down the branch until being confronted by a huge ant, which begins sniffing the front of the vehicle. Miss Frizzle describes the ant as a guard ant and explains its activity as merely inspecting the bus to make sure it isn't a risk to the queen which resides somewhere behind it. After slipping off the tree branch, the bus is saved from a crash landing when it is caught up on the back of a hawk. As the powerful bird rises out of the trees and heads towards its mountaintop nest, the vehicle ascends in the lift capsule. The bird lands and the bus is spilled off its back into a snowy slope below it. With a cold cloud of snow and wind splashing into riders' faces, the vehicle proceeds forward onto the drop track. Miss Frizzle begins describing how the air pressure on a mountaintop will affect the drastic change in temperature. In addition, the greater the altitude, the more likely that she could lose signal with the bus. Suddenly, the light on the front of the vehicle flickers as Miss Frizzle's voice cuts in and out. As the bus reels toward the edge of a snowy cliff, it gets lodged inches from disaster. But, as riders take a hopeful deep breath, the cliff begins cracking. Miss Frizzle's voice goes silent and the lights cut off completely. The bus breaks off the edge and the drop track plummets riders downward. The next thing the riders realize is that they've emerged alive and well after their plunge. But the danger isn't over. The bus has skidded out onto a frozen pond where the ice begins cracking before dropping them through into the pitch black icy depths below. Out of the darkness, a spotlight from the vehicle reveals that the bus has transformed into a submarine. With only the spotlight revealing the bus's surroundings, riders get startled yet again as hungry sharks begin swarming around them. And then, in the distance, another small light is seen. It gets bigger and bigger until we see Miss Frizzle swimming through the cold water with a headlamp and spear gun. 
The sharks hurtle away in terror, and Miss Frizzle commends her students for their courage and success in finding her, regains connection with the bus, and directs it home. The bus reemerges from a small pond outside the back of the school property and retransforms into the ride vehicle. Pulling outside of the school entrance, their teacher is there to meet them and explains how she couldn't have made it without her class. And Miss Frizzle herself is the one to give riders directions on how to unload and proceed to the ride's exit. While the story arc of Manic Field Trip was laid out in detail here, the initial glimpse into the story would usually be much more vague and conceptual. Within the themed entertainment industry, an idea is often first conceptualized by a creative Blue Sky team. Before the idea can proceed downward to become a safe, practical reality, the Blue Sky team may present their vision through means of storyboarding and images known as show scenes. These are standalone pictures of what scenes within the ride experience may look like. What will the riders be seeing? What will they be pointing at? What are the focal points of the scene? These are examples of show scenes for Manic Field Trip, including a conceptual representation of Scene 6, Ant Encounter. And Scene 8, Submarine Shark Attack. This concludes your Manic Field Trip. I presented to you my idea for this attraction's space design and ride building, as well as the ride mechanisms, including the ride vehicle and its six DOFs, the drop track, and the scene carousel. I also laid out the story arc of my ride by highlighting the scenes within the attraction. Looking back, we can evaluate the success of this attraction in regards to the three main project goals I laid out in the beginning. By utilizing existing technology and seeking to honor the concepts and property of the TV show, Manic Field Trip is definitely something that I could see being actually implemented in real life. The story arc and theming of both the space and the vehicle contribute to making it a unique experience set apart from existing attractions. And of course, the intricate blend of physical and digital or projected elements make it an experience that is also very entertaining. But before we leave, did you catch any of the Easter eggs? Any of those small personal details that help tie together my ride, this presentation, and valuable things in real life? In the ride story, you as the writer are a member of Miss Frizzle's class immediately after the one in the show. The pre-show classroom commemorates the accomplishments of the fourth grade class of 1997, which is the year the Four Seasons show stopped airing. Also, if you recall from the show, there were only eight students in Miss Frizzle's class. Here, there are ten. This is Max and Angus Gerber, two of my nephews and some of the most creative little minds I know. You may have also noticed Ralphie's curiosity getting him into trouble multiple times such as intruding on my user personas, or drawing himself playing baseball on the classroom wall. But in the end, we hope he learned his lesson after Miss Frizzle made him pay for it. You may have also noticed the class running low on yellow chalk midway through my presentation. They even ran out completely mid-sentence and needed to switch to red in order to finish. And finally, the book Dorothy Ann was reading was actually the story of Magic School Bus Manic Field Trip, written and published by a student at the International Center for Creativity. Maybe you noticed these things. Maybe you didn't, and getting them revealed to you now has only made this whole experience even more fun and rewarding for you. But that's what good themed entertainment designers do. They'll place those small details in a scene, in a queue, or even off in the distance that maybe only 1% of writers will catch. But a good story deserves to have all of those stops pulled out, so that every rider coming off of a ride will only want to do one thing. Get right back in line. Thank you for riding along with me today on the Magic School Bus Manic Field Trip. Enjoy the rest of your day.